I'll be speaking to Ivan Karkashian from the Defense for Children International Palestine, who just gave a uh, heart-rending talk at the Tree of Life conference here in Cape Cod. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. One of the things you were talking about was the difference in treatment of uh, Palestinian children who throw a stone versus an Israeli Jewish child who does the same thing. Could you repeat that? Sure. So since 1967, the West Bank has been under military occupation and subject to military law. Uh, in the military law, there are security offenses, and one of those security offenses is throwing stones for Palestinians. Uh, Palestinian children caught throwing a stone at the separation barrier, for example, could face up to 10 years in prison. That's when you realize the, the military system in the West Bank is intended to control the entire population. But you also have... Uh, Wait a second. Somebody could throw a rock at a wall could get 10 years. Well, so any if if you're caught throwing a stone or a rock at a at a military object, and that's what the separation barrier is considered, or a military watchtower, for example, or a military uh, jeep that's stationed, then you could face ten years. If the military jeep is moving, or if you throw it at a person, then it's twenty years. Um, those are extreme sentences that are seldom applied, but what they do show. Is, uh, is that this system is intended to control the population in the West Bank. Uh, that said, uh, Israeli Jewish settlers who live in the same area, who live in the West Bank, are not subject to military law. They're subject to Israel's civilian legal system and civil criminal law. Um, and, and under that system, there is no offense of throwing stones. If you throw a stone and you're an, an Israeli Jewish child, then and you cause property damage, then you're charged under the various uh, vandalism laws. But you're not charged for the mere act of throwing a stone the same way a Palestinian child is. And so often when you see clashes between Israeli uh, Jewish settler youths and Palestinian youths, the Palestinian youths will get completely rounded up uh, whereas the Jewish youth can go home after the, after the clash. And, and part of the reason also why that exists is because the, the Israeli military is not there to, to control the Israeli Jewish settler population. They're there to control just the Palestinian settler population. And they have no authority uh, as a military to arrest a civilian and that's what Israeli Jewish settler children are considered, and settler, settlers, Jewish settlers in the West Bank considered civilians under Israel's legal system, and the military has absolutely no authority over them. And so they get away with anything that they do without any repercussions, and the Palestinians get rounded up and arrested. You showed a video of a kid, a recent video of a kid who uh, was taken by uh, soldiers, a small child who people in the area said was had mental problems and so on. And that was disturbing, but this, what you told afterwards about the routine treatment of a kid who is blindfolded and, and so on, could you talk about that? Sure. So children are often, um, the, the vast majority of children, 60% of them, are arrested for stone throwing. Um, they're not arrested during the day. We find that over half of them are actually arrested in the middle of the night, around 2 or 3 a.m. And, and we're talking about children as young as 12. Um, and, and they're taken, their pl plastic ties are put around their arms, um, blindfolds, they're escorted to a military jeep, sat on the metal floor of the military jeep with soldiers on benches. Um, and the soldiers on the benches looking down on these children on the metal floor begin to abuse them verbally or physically. And we've had disturbing cases where soldiers found an empty beer bottle in the military jeep and used it to smash it on, on the head of a kid. We've had incidents where soldiers would be smoking cigarettes and extinguish them on the arms and lips of children. Um, and then because it's the middle of the, uh, the night, the interrogators that are there to interrogate the children are not ready to show up for work yet. So children are transferred to a military base where they're kept outdoors oftentimes or in a small dirty room, sometimes with a military dog. Um, and throughout that period, they're denied access to water, food, or toilets. If the children ask for any of these things, they face further abuse. 
Um, and also they're strip searched multiple times uh, during the arrest process, uh, all humiliating and terrifying the child. What's, what's even more worrying is the fact that the parents don't know why their child has been arrested or where their child is being taken. So essentially, when a 12-year-old, when a 13-year-old child gets arrested, uh, he, he disappears for a period of 24 hours, and a 14- and 15-year-old child disappears for a period of 48 hours, and if you're 16 and older, if you're 16 and 17, then you disappear for up to 96 hours, where your parents have no idea where you are or why you've been arrested. Now, I assume you've complained about this, your organization. You ever get any satisfaction? Any, anyone ever get punished? Anything get changed? So our organization, which is made up of uh, attorneys that represent around 25% of kid, Palestinian kids caught up in the military court system, military detention system, submits uh, multiple complaints on, on their behalf every year. We've never gotten a, a good resolution, not once. Um, part of the problem uh, for that is if, if the complaint is against the military, the military refuses to have that child complaining of being abused by the military to have his attorney present while he's giving his testimony. So they expect the child to go to the same system that abused him and testify without the protections of, of an attorney by him. And that's where we draw the line. We don't want to re-traumatize the kid by having him re -testify. Wait, they, they want the kid, the little 12-year-old kid, to be surrounded by Israeli soldiers again? By the Israeli military prosecution and the military police and to uh, testify against the person who abused him, who would be in the room, and that child would be completely alone in that room. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have his attorney by his side uh, as a sort of protection. And, and, and the idea of having to face your abuser in the same system that abused you and to raise your voice, most children w would be too scared to do that because they think they'll invite further abuse if they're ever caught up again in the same system. Um, and so that's where we've drawn the red line. And ac accordingly, the Israeli prosecution, military prosecution, says we're not cooperating with the investigation and there isn't therefore enough evidence and they close the investigations without anyone being held accountable. What about interrogation? You talked about kids being interrogated. Could you talk about that here? Sure, so children are strapped to a low, small metal chair. They're shackled, their legs are shackled, their, arm, their hands are shackled. And usually you get one to two interrogators, sometimes playing good cop, bad cop on the child. These are extremely professional uh, police or, or intelligence interrogators uh, trying to uh, coerce a confession out of a child that's been primed to give a confession from the horrendous circumstances under which he was arrested and transferred for interrogation. Um, during interrogation, if the child doesn't cooperate, they start uh, verbally abusing him, screaming at him, intimidating him. And if that doesn't work, there's some form of physical abuse that comes into the picture. And if that fails, they'll place the child in solitary confinement until they get a confession. And just to be clear, solitary confinement is a very, very small two by four uh, cell with no windows or any uh, natural light coming into it. There's a yellow, uh, there's a dim yellow light that's kept on 24 hours a day. There are protrusions from the wall so that the child can't rest. And these are kids, the kids these being treated. Kids. These are 15, 16, 17 year olds. Just to be clear, Defense for Children International Palestine considers anyone under the age of 18 as a child. And that's according to international law. Um, and these what about a right not to talk? I mean, in the United States, yeah, you know, on, on every TV show, they have your right to remain silent. Yeah. What about that? So that's the only right that actually exists under military law for these children, uh, but they're seldom advised of that right. So they'll, in fact, the interrogators would tell them if they were to confess very quickly, then they would be let out faster. Of course, the children aren't given access to an attorney prior to the interrogation, don't have an attorney present during the question, and they don't even have a parent present during the questioning. So they're, they're, they're alone. They, do, they don't know that anyone's out there looking after them. Um, and under those circumstances and under that kind of treatment, solitary confinement and the coercion, 
most children confess whether they did something or they didn't do anything. Um, and importantly, actually, at uh, this point I'd like to add is oftentimes the interrogators typing up the child's statement. We find that in one in five cases, that statement is written in Hebrew and the child is made to sign it when the child doesn't even understand the language or what he signed. So they often sign confessions uh, that they haven't read and haven't even understood. So, and, and those confessions are used to convict these children. Now, are, are you based in West Bank or Gaza or where are you? So Defense for Children International Palestine has its headquarters in Ramallah, but we have offices also in Hebron and Nablus. And then we have field workers in East Jerusalem and in Gaza. Now, you know, for 50 days or so, Gaza was in the headlines every day and then Cease fire and boom, we're on to something else. Um, but you mentioned, I mean, just to jump to a completely different topic, you said there's something like 300,000 mental Ill injuries in Gaza? Not mental injuries. There's about 373,000 children that have been traumatized by the, the latest offensive on the Gaza Strip. These children require psychosocial support. Um, and, and what's important here to realize is that vast number is, is, is only part of the problem because a lot of these, uh, there are far more children who have been traumatized from previous offensives. And there's a, there's a situation where we find children continually being re-traumatized to the point that they, you know, they've had the psychosocial support before and it hasn't saved them because they, the next military offensive, uh, they'll be faced with the same situation. So it's, it's a very difficult situation for humanitarian aid organizations and people trying to get the necessary help for these children because ultimately they realize if a second, if another offensive were to take place, it, it puts them back to square one and then adds to the problem further because you're only traumatizing further people. And I'd like to mention the case of the Abu Jamir family. They had an eight-year-old child there who survived uh, the three offensives, uh, one in 2006, in 2009, and then in 2012, only to die in the latest offensive as an eight-year-old. And he died along with 18 other children from, the, from his same family. Um, and so when, when you think of, of the surviving children of that family and what they must think, it's just the trauma is, is, uh, is mind-boggling. Yeah, it is all mind-boggling. Um, tell me a little bit more about your organization. How long has it been around? Sure. So Defense for Children International Palestine was established in 1991 as a strictly legal aid organization to provide free legal aid to children caught in the military detention system. Uh, w the way it happened is our, our founder was in prison himself. Um, as, a, as a political activist, and he realized when he was in prison that there were no uh, protections for children in the Israeli military detention system. They were being treated exactly as adults. So when he, when he was released, he established Defense for Children International Palestine. Um, and then in 2000, we expanded to begin monitoring all violations by the Israeli side against Palestinian children. And in 2005, we expanded yet again to monitor all violations by the Palestinian side against Palestinian children and to also provide legal aid for Palestinian children caught up with the Palestinian law or in conflict with the Palestinian law itself. And at that point became a fully fledged uh, Palestinian children's rights organization uh, defending children children from uh, violations by any perpetrators, whether they be Israeli or Palestinian. Well, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you so much for having me and for this opportunity.